So the university is a special place. And it's often seen and hailed as one of the last public spaces for free thought, for open dialogue, and for creative learning. And that's a good thing. But in an age of competing expectations and digital distractions, teaching more often feels like walking the beat. So put your cell phone away. You please stop texting. Um, you know, try composing an essay that's more than 140 characters. Um, experts speculate that this generation right now that's at college, the so-called digital natives, these are the generation born since the 1980s, the first to grow up with digital technologies, are even wired in fundamentally different ways. And so I wonder, if this is true, then why do we continue to use 20th century education for 21st century students? Whose world are these students actually learning for? And let me illustrate this thought um, with a clip from the HBO television series, a drama called The Wire. And in this next scene, Howard Bunny Colvin, who's a former police major, works with a university team studying um, at-risk delinquent youth in a Baltimore middle school. And here, what's really interesting is the role of teacher and learner have been reversed. What's the point? Bill not even wants to spend us, right? Right. What's the point? So we're here, like it or not. To make sure I feel any better, the word around school is, you're down here because you beat the system. You had no interest in being in a classroom, and you made the classroom impossible for everybody else. And now you're out. You won. <laughs> yeah. You feel like winners? Always. Yeah, that's how we do. Who's we? <laughs> Us. No, who are you? Players. Kingpins? Nah, that comes later. Right now, we're just corner boys. So how long until you're kingpins? I'm thinking two, three years. Two, three years. <laughs> Let me ask, and I want everybody to write this down. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Come on, pencil and paper. This isn't schoolwork. This is about y'all. She's young, but she's good. Yeah, a doctoral candidate from the psych department at College Park. Thesis work is on social alienation among adolescents. All right, show of hands. How many wrote MBA? You have it only for the Lakers, though. I want to be a pediatric neurosurgeon like that one. What's his name? Ben Carson. Yeah, that dude. He's a black surgeon at Hopkins and Long. You want to be a surgeon, you need to go to medical school. What all? How many wrote down dead? But you saw that coming, huh? <laughs> Shame y'all have so little time and you're wasting it here with us. You know where you're going, and we can't teach you anything you don't know about that, right? That's what we've been saying. Naaman, put away the magazine. I ain't reading no magazine. Naaman. What? It ain't even mine. It was laying here when I came in. <laughs> Yeah, little pisses. <laughs> you know, we're giving them a fine education. It ain't even mine. It was just laying here when I came in. You know, this right here, the whole damn school. You know, the way they carry themselves, it's training for the street. The building's the system. We the cops. Yeah, you are for sure. I mean, y'all, y'all come in here every day and practice getting over. Try running all different kind of games. You know, it's price for the corner, right? Ain't no real cops, ain't no real danger. But y'all are getting something out of this. Bet you didn't even know that. Still rather be out there. Right, can I? Corner boys, huh? Hey, let me ask y'all something. You know, you help us hone in on this, and maybe we do a little better job with you in here. What makes a good corner boy? Keep your eyes open. Keep the count straight. Don't trust nobody. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You don't got no respect in the Israel. You don't got no respect. You ain't got no money. If you stupid in the hood, you get killed. You ain't got no problem. You got nothing. Laughter, street talk, a scene so gripping it almost breaks your heart. Um, the quote, you already know where you're going, and we can't teach you anything you don't know about that. What if this was the starting point for teaching the digital natives? For the next few minutes, um, I draw on my experience teaching an urban geography class in which we use the wire as our central text to understand how capital and socio-spatial difference actually shape the city. Set and shot on location in Baltimore, uh, the wire premiered in 2002 and ran to 2008 for a total of uh, 60 episodes. 
And many critics praise the show for its nuanced portrayal of urban life. As one critic observes, the show's title referred to the wiretap that a unit of the Baltimore police force was using to keep a local drug organization under surveillance. But ultimately, the term suggested more, the way that the show allowed viewers to eavesdrop on recondite power plays, and the ways that poverty, politics, and policing were interconnected in a struggling post-industrial city. And Teaching the Wire also gave me the space to critically examine three common claims about digital natives and television. And first, there's the mantra that I think every parent probably uses. TV makes you dumb. In our class, however, we treated the wire and television as a text, as an open book, as a device for discovery, and as a force for new ideas. And so the first task was to teach students to actually read television. Take Allison. Here, she uses the wire to analyze the subtle differences in meaning between commodities, um, between commodities and money, capital and money, as well as tr um, tracing their impact on the Baltimore landscape. She writes, by the end of season one, it is clear that Barksdale's operation run much deeper than the drug trade. Avon, who is the cartel chief, does not just accumulate money through each drug transaction. He accumulates capital through each exchange. And capital, she points out, is something much more complex than money. It involves the accumulation of dispensable labor power, which helps wield power. The distinction is made even clearer when drug money is traced back to a local politician. When Avon is sentenced to jail, it becomes clear that this is merely part of the game. And critics have compared The Wire to a Russian novel, calling it more tragic than a Greek uh, tragedy. And the show's compelling characters, such as Omar, a favorite of many fans, transcend the usual whodunit formula of TV crime shows like Law and Order and others, which allow students, such as Allison, to read The Wire for wider um, insights into the world. Indeed, creator and um, director David Simon once argued, The Wire was never intended to be a cop show. We were always planning to move farther and farther out, to build a whole city. Which brings me to myth number two. If something is entertaining, it can't be educational. The converse of such thinking is, scantrons are boring, and therefore an effective learning tool. And not surprisingly, students such as Danny Lee in my class take issue with this very point. He writes, I really enjoyed how The Wire presented serious issues in an entertaining manner. People don't like to be told what's wrong with the world or themselves unless there's a mediator, such as comedy or entertainment. And I liked how it balanced the two. Furthermore, it was interesting to see the viewpoints of different social and economic classes and what each, what each go through. I don't think I've ever seen a TV show that addresses such serious issues, and I was really glad I was introduced to this show. And Danny's point touches on a special aspect of The Wire. In many ways, the show is so complex in terms of character depth, interwoven storylines, and the ultimate non-resolution of is issues that it arguably condenses life into a useful analytic, a text. This point leads me to a third and final myth, the idea that digital natives consume visual media in such a certain manner, hunched over a laptop, uh, headphones on, usually alone, binging and purging on several episodes in a row until like three in the morning. You can tell how I watch the show. Um, and that this method ultimately leads to less critical thinking or less critical perspectives when they're actually consuming this text. And before this class, I too actually believe that myth, even of myself. But my students luckily proved me wrong again and again. Take Thea. She writes, I've been thinking a lot about the wire's treatment of poverty and to what extent it could be described as voyeuristic. Particularly in season one, many show, um, see shots of the pit, which is a low income housing project, are taken from car windows, from rooftops, from the perspective of actually being outside of action. We, as viewers, are rarely taken into domestic spaces of the people living in the pit, but this dynamic changes as the seasons progress. And obviously, the decision to shoot the scenes is parallel to the themes of surveillance and wiretapping that are central to the show. But that doesn't mean, necessarily, that it isn't voyeuristic either. What do you all think? A student who has watched The Wire is not fully prepared, of course, we're not so naive to think, that they could navigate a brick-and-mortar city like Baltimore. The 
The Wire is not news, it's not photography, it's not um, documentary film, and its portrayal of Baltimore is both partial and limited. But most importantly, as Thea points out, there is actually no way around uncomfortable issues of power, of inequality, and positionality in the city. You must actually go right through it, and that's what we aim to do in the class. And so I'll close with a few thoughts. Over the past 25 years, standardized tests have reverse engineered the US public education system. And so the test that stars in season four, um, which is from the clip that you saw, is a reflection of the mandated achievement test that emerged in response to a 1983 National Commission in a report. And this report warned that if the country were to remain economically competitive at the international level, the skills of the nation's workforce would have to dramatically improve. And so by 2001, the standardized achievement test became the cornerstone of President Bush's No Child Left Behind policy. And nearly all US states have uh, reset content and performance standards through systems of school and teacher um, accountability for test scores. And throughout season four, we see and we witness how strong the force field of the test is. It pulls in all the characters principals, teachers, students, even the textbooks themselves are oriented around this force. And there's a paradox here. We caught a glimpse of it in the clip that I played. In contrast to raising learning outcomes, the test instead tends to measure how well students are trained to take it. Bunny calls the standardized test bullshit. Bunny never cuts, minces words, saying that, quote, the test material don't speak loud to their world or mine neither. As a tool, the standardized test configures learning as an abstract, disembodied activity, in contrast to a situated moment in the lived experiences and lives of students. And as viewers, as voyeurs, as consumers of this, we also see the test working to organize a set of expectations about students as laborers in training in preparation for an imagined future, such as a pediatric neurosurgeon, in a way of life that might not simply be open to them. And so the digital natives have been called lazy. They've been called annoying. Uh, I heard one quote, an on-demand generation with very active thumbs, unrealistic expectations, and a really work, weak work ethic. But from my experience in the classroom, this characterization feels quite false. In terms of epistemology, or how students actually understand and learn the world, digital natives are different. As new technologies unfold with dizzying speed, the 21st century classroom has to make way for 21st century citizens. Because they're not learning for our world, they're learning for theirs. Thank you.